Bernard, thank you very much. And to the branch, <clears throat> very honored to be delivering this John Charnley lecture, uh, having attended many uh, and, uh, and met Sir John, of course, um, uh, in happier times. So um, the lecture this evening is a, uh, a rehash of one I gave as my inaugural lecture at the University of East Anglia, uh, which is quite entertaining because I've been a professor for 14 years by that stage, but, but there you go. Um, it's, it reflects on research that I've done or, or been a part of a team of, but really what I want to sell it as a narrative. So rather than just the research, try and give you a sense of what I was interested in and, and, and why and why the research. Um, and when I actually, um, I started work, when I left Cambridge, I, I went down the road to work at, at Hatfield, um, which was a fabulous place. I used to look forward to going to work on a Monday morning. And uh, there's not many of us can say that. Um, but <clears throat> always used to feel in, in research department at Hatfield, you needed to speak the language of academia and the design office. Uh, you needed to be able to understand the, uh, the, the philosophy of each. And um, obviously, I've had quite a lot of philosophy of academia over the last few years. Um, but I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. So, <clears throat> what is turbulence? I mean, I, I think we all uh, we would associate turbulence with weather events. Um, and when I deliver this lecture title to the team at UEA, uh, one of the ladies got very excited. She said, "I'm a nervous traveller. You know, you're going to help me understand turbulence and aircraft." I'm not. I'm afraid. Um, that's not the turbulence I'm, I'm going to be uh, looking at. Um, but um, you know, some of the things I was emphasising about turbulence is is mixing. Okay, that's that's what it does. It mixes momentum, which can be a nuisance, can be a good thing. Uh, dissipates energy, which is usually not a good thing. But the thing, the key thing about turbulence, of course, is that um, uh, it mixes mass, and that's uh, a very important property of of turbulence. <clears throat> and if you take nothing away from this evening. Uh, other than <clears throat> the message about when you're stirring your tea or coffee, <clears throat> you should flat the spoon from side to side. Don't go round and round. Solid body rotation never mixed anything. So um, reminds me of a, a conference in the States when I was accosted by a very eminent US academic called uh, Bill Sarek, who took me to task for pouring cream into my coffee rather than the other way around. He said, Chris, every Fluid dynamicist knows that you'll get much better mixing if you pour the coffee into the cream. But I was able to reply uh, sharpish. I said, but Bill, I'm interested in the flow visualization, not the mixing. So a lot of what I talk about is friction. OK, so drag, fuel burn, all that kind of stuff originates from friction. <clears throat> and here's a, a very simple thing that I tell my students is why, why do we get friction? Um, well, we all know about molecular diffusion, Brownian motion, and two parallel streams of fluid that are going at slightly different speeds. Well, even if they're going at the same speed, they'll be exchanging um, particles. You know, there'll be molecules diffusing across from one to the other. But if the streams are at different speed, then uh, the momentum migrating upwards from streamline U1 uh, will be bringing lower momentum into streamline U2 then U2 will be transferring back to U1, okay? If there's a change of momentum, there has to be a force, a rate of change of momentum, uh, and it's a force acting parallel to the uh, to the stream, so it's a shear force, and that that is essentially where friction comes from. Now, in turbulence, we replace the molecular diffusion by large-scale churning of the flow. Uh, and so, uh, weirdly, and, the, and fluids is an extraordinary... Uh, science because um, we talk about fluids transporting mass, momentum and energy, but they're also transporting themselves. OK, so um, the idea of uh, breaking down fluid motion into straight lines with a, a kind of circular motion superimposed on the top um, is baffling, but it but it seems to work. So if we're churning momentum through turbulent motion, I'll bring up a video here to see what that looks like. Um, there's a credit on the next slide. <clears throat> you can see that the effect is far, far greater in terms of momentum transfer. 
um, and that's and that's the issue. Okay, so um, the other thing we've got is that if you look at the image, I'll try not to use a pointer because I know people online won't won't be seeing it. But if you look at the image, then uh, as you get close to the surface of the wing section, there something different is happening, and and turbulent motion needs room to move. So as it gets close to a wall, it gets constrained, and there's all sorts of interesting things going on just in that in that region. So it's a fascinating subject, um, one in which uh, uh, many people, certainly computational modelers, seem to have lost their careers in 50 years of turbulence modeling. Uh, I did a bit of it for my PhD. So when I started work at Hatfield, I thought, I know what, I'll move to laminar flow. That's a lot easier. And that's what I did. Um, and of course, the big question in laminar flow is how long can you hang on to it and when does it become turbulent? So that's essentially what um, what I've been looking at over many years, um, and uh, and what I remain interested in to this day. And you know, to be honest, <clears throat> there are um, many famous sons of Bedford and Bedfordshire and Cranfield in particular who who looked at this area. Uh, John Green, who passed away this year, was very interested in turbulent boundary layers and Ian Pohl. Uh, so I'm I'm not really in their league, but there you go. <clears throat> so. This is a still from the, um, uh, uh, this is Aachen University simulation, nice simulation, completely unrepresentative uh, conditions though. Those of you who know what a Reynolds number is, a uh, Reynolds number of 50,000 is, uh, is not often one that I, uh, I'm interested in. But it's a good, good example of the chaos in green at the right hand of the picture that is turbulence. So what we're looking at, the transition phenomenon, is really when that blue sheet starts to go wavy. And those are Tommy Schlichting waves, and they very rapidly break down into an awful mess. Um, and the bit that, um, <clears throat> that I'm going to talk to you about first starts off with this sort of scribble across the leading edge of the wing, which is um, what I call, or what is called, the receptivity process. And um, turbulence is obviously chaotic motions, but they originate from natural disturbances that you can't we can't avoid. So finite surface tolerance, you know, you go down to atomic level and surfaces are rough, and you also have um, entropy, entropy spots in any stream of air, particularly in a wind tunnel, um, dust, whatever. So <clears throat> typically, we kind of assume that there's some very interesting but nanoscale stuff going on at the leading edge that creates disturbances that grow, and they eventually become those waves and turn into those noodles and uh, the sort of kelp bed at the, end of, at the end of the picture. And what I've done there with a the smiley face um, is to talk about, describe the bit that we can model. Uh, well, I can, we can model quite a lot of it. This is clearly a model of a very complicated process. But in the context of trying to get something predictive that might influence the design process, um, we can model that bit that I've in indicated there. So it's kind of what I'm going to talk about this evening. So <clears throat> if we go to a swept wing, and we're now if you're kind of looking at eras, we're talking about 1996 when I started working with Caroline and with Pat Ashell, and, uh, Irene and Laurie Godet here at Bedford. Um, this is the kind of thing we were looking at. So again, uh, patchworking lots of images that are not entirely um, uh, easy bedfellows. Again, so the Van Dyke book is fabulous, um, but that isn't that isn't what a boundary layer on a transonic aircraft um, would behave as. But you can generally see uh, the early stages of those waves turning into um, into uh, lambda shapes and then uh, and then streaks. And that sort of happens in the middle part of the wing, as indicated um, by the arrow. So that's what we'd call the rooftop of the pressure distribution. But as uh, we discovered from Vulcan and other aircraft, something else happens <clears throat> towards the leading edge. Um, and I've used here a Kahama picture of a, a rotating forebody because um, some of the best visualizations of what are known as cross flow vortices come from these kind of flows. And physics, you know, in terms of the physics, they're very similar to what's happened to the leading edge of a wing. Um, I've got some images here which are generated by uh, a co-worker, Shahid Magal, who uh, I worked with at Hatfield. He then went on to 
University of Manchester, and then he's now at Imperial, who did some simulation. So that is a slice, a cross section, if you like, through the flow very near the wing. Uh, the, the plane, the section plane, is, is, if you like, parallel to the leading edge, very close to the leading edge. So that the flow is going into the page, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> and what you see there, the color contours are the stratification of velocity, if you like, the contours of forward speed. Um, blue very slow because it's near the surface, red faster because it's away from the boundary layer. And these cross flow forces basically, you know, this is elemental mixing. I wouldn't say it's turbulence, but it's, uh, it's like a vortex generator, if you like. It's, it's bringing high momentum fluid, the red stuff, down towards the surface, and it's pulling uh, low momentum fluid up. And again, you can sort of describe it by uh, similar mathematics. Uh, but we'll see in a minute that it's not entirely straightforward um, applying the same approach to both of those physical phenomena, even though they start off with infinitesimal disturbances uh, in much the same way as each other. So that's kind of um, turbulence and transition. Uh, oh, yes, OK. And then here, uh, here's my simple theory. And I guess the point is, if you look at the uh, body of rotation on the left, the simple theory stops way before you start to see any structure, uh, any kind of um, vortical structure in the boundary layer. Um, whereas for the, uh, the mid-chord region, the Tommy Schlichting waves, the simple theory takes us a lot further towards the flow being obviously beginning to be chaotic. Uh, so there you go. Right. So <clears throat> that's what I've been looking at. What is the point? You know, why would we want to tame turbulence? Um, well, there's two stages. One is prediction, uh, and the other is control. Okay. Um, and then, what have I been looking at? Um, well, the classic thing actually about the onset of, of uh, laminar turbulent flow is um, extrapolating from wind tunnel scale to flight scale, which we now use extensively use computational methods for. But if you don't get the physics of that transition correct, um, then you know, you're not going to get the right results. And organizations like ARA um, have perfected techniques of fooling the physics, if you like, thinking that it's a larger scale, um, and done it very, very cleverly based on an understanding of the effects of transition and turbulence on the boundary layer flow. Um, not necessarily um, much more than that, and there was always the risk. And I think there was always a big debate between Airbus and Boeing about um, who was applying too much transition tripping to their wind tunnel models and, and fouling up their, their drag estimates. But scaling from wind tunnel to flight, very relevant to where we are today. Um, but also, my area of interest was in reducing drag, reducing fuel burn of aircraft, and it remains an interest. It remains topical, even with all the talk of electric propulsion and hydrogen propulsion, you know, these are hugely heavy uh, solutions to go on the aircraft. So uh, you want to reduce your requirement for any kind of propulsion uh, by reducing the drag of the aircraft. And the other thing, which is, is perhaps less well known, is that turbulence is uh, a key aspect to high lift system design. So low speed performance, where the whole mixing thing stops being a bad thing, that gives us more drag and starts being a good thing because it shares the energy uh, around the aerodynamics a little bit more, which is what we need. So <clears throat> going a little bit technical now, let's start off with some wind tunnel data. So what we've got here is um, some uh, a diagram and some stills from paper by uh, that Caroline, Pat and um, Irene put together. Um, for the uh, second European Laminar Flow Forum, so 1996, I was telling you about it. This was a nice model designed to go in the eight foot that you could swing, uh, swing the wing back, and there was a, uh, a center body and a tip body that is effectively kept the pressure distribution the same from root to span, root to tip, um, and that allowed you to, to create this sort of um, ideal for swept wings of, of just having a, a, a two degree of freedom problem while still having swept wing flow. 
And the four images are labeled with the angle of attack, the angle of incidence of the wing, showing you where the change from laminar to turbulent flow is. And the um, hot regions of high treat heat, uh, high temperature are low heat transfer, therefore laminar flow. Uh, and then where it goes grayer um, before the end of the uh, of the infrared region, which is sort of, I don't know, 40% span of the wing, I guess. Um, so the flows from left to right. Um, and the gray area is where the turbulent mixing is getting to work and it's taking heat away from the surface because that's what turbulence does well. And so the surface is slightly cooler, therefore the image is grayer. And you can see particularly at the one and a half, the zero, one and a half degree images, um, we see what we call turbulent wedges. So little imperfections in the surface that cause turbulence to appear sooner. But the interesting thing is here is, is you, you, see, you see a changeover from the two mechanisms that I outlined on the previous slide. So negative angle of attack, um, we've got a very benign pressure distribution, at least on one side, uh, and um, sorry, not benign one, we've got, um, we have quite a, Benign pressure distribution, which is actually hostile to cross-flow instability. So at minus one degree, transition is quite close to the leading edge because of cross-flow instability. And then as we reduce um, that favorable pressure gradient, cross-flow modes are less stimulated. So the change from turbulent to laminar to turbulent flow moves back, almost to fill in the one and a half degrees to fill the infrared panel apart from these turbulent wedges. But then as we carry on increasing the angle of attack, then we get the um, hostile pressure gradient and that stimulates the, the other type of instability. And so the change to turbulence moves closer to the leading edge. Um, and actually distinguishing between these two uh, mechanisms was really quite important in those days and, and indeed seeing whether they interacted. So now we're gonna leap to um, a bit of theory and um, something called N factors, which are pretty difficult to explain quickly. Think of it as a, a gain, a logarithmic gain in amplitude. And um, why do we use a gain rather than a physical amplitude of disturbances? Because it's um, pretty much impossible to measure uh, these kind of nanoscale environmental uh, forcing at the leading edge. So the best thing we can do is with our analysis tools is just say, well, we understand the effects of pressure gradient and sweep, and they're going to make these disturbances grow in amplitude. And, um, and the label to the graph on the right hand side says, um, and factors for various F beta combinations. So F is the temporal frequency and beta is effectively the span wise frequency. So how, um, how diagonal these waves are uh, and if beta was zero, it would be a two-dimensional wave marching down the wing. And we've got two, two different zones here. Uh, we'll see on the next plot nowadays, people tend to separate out the two mechanisms and plot them separately, these N factors. And I've indicated using the images, the cross-flow um, modes are on the bottom left and the two-dimensional Tommy Schlichting modes are the ones on the bottom right. And they respond differently to the classical things of pressure distribution, sweep angle from each other. So as you vary the attitude of the wing, um, the, the kind of plateau on the left will go up and down, uh, and, the, uh, and the slope of the, the mountain on the right will also, will also vary. Now, it turns out that this gain method worked pretty well, um, which really frustrated the people who understood the physics and the maths very well, because they thought, you know, like physicists and mathematicians also always think, it shouldn't work. I know it's wrong if it shouldn't work. So why does it work? Well, essentially, um, most people who are doing these kind of experiments had the same uh, level of professionalism in their workshops, and they had the same or similar levels of flow quality in their wind tunnels. So what effectively is that your standard wind tunnel tests were run at a very comparable environmental flow condition. 
so the gain method worked because the initial conditions, the initial amplitudes uh, were very similar. Okay, and there were a few miscreants who tried to put models in rubbish tunnels and got, who, who got very different results. But generally speaking, the idea of a, uh, a, a universal gain um, gathered some kind of traction uh, <clears throat> as a criterion for saying, well, when we get to um, this level of n factor, then we expect to see turbulence occur. The, the difficulty with that is, as you start to dig into that a little more carefully, you see there's some uncertainty in this critical n factor. Okay, it can go up and down. Um, and you can see that if my critical n factor is hitting my mountain on the right, then quite a significant variation in critical n gives me perhaps 5% chord movement in the change from laminar turbulent flow, which is pretty good actually uh, in terms of what we know. However, if you took that um, uncertainty in n factor uh, and moved it down to an n factor of about five uh, or six, then it would be catastrophic because you wouldn't be sure if you were getting cross flow induced transition or if you weren't, okay? Um, and, you know, again, little anecdote, I don't want <clears throat> to rattle on too long, but when I, when I was working at Farnborough, um, Kinetic at that stage were sponsoring Williams uh, Formula One. And um, I had a very interesting discussion with the Williams aerodynamicists, and I suppose it was, that was about the time that Williams had stopped winning championship after championship. And <clears throat> I was sh proudly shown this pressure distribution on their rear wing, which they described as a Bactrian because it had two suction peaks. Um, and I thought, well, that's going to play merry hell with your transition because you're absolutely not going to know whether you're going to get transition at the front peak or the back peak. And you might, <clears throat> you might with a nice clean car configuration, expect to get transition at the back peak. And then the minute you start to get all the rubbish that comes off the road, the tire rubber and the grit and everything on the wing, uh, transition would suddenly jump to the front suction peak and your drag on your car would suddenly go up by 40% um, halfway around um, the circuit. And do um, you know, they reported that the car performed very well in the opening laps, but then seemed to slow down. So, you know, you need to be careful about taking this as truth. And, you know, we all know as engineers that uncertainty uh, is the big thing. So um, as regards uncertainty, the, um, um, the issue of Tommy Schlichting modes, which are the, 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 um, the ones that the Van Dyke picture captures and the cross flow modes have a very different, um, have a different influence. Now, interestingly, um, these are the results from the uh, eight foot tunnel test plotted uh, the actual measurement versus the predicted locations based on the theory applied to pressure distributions, sweep angle and so on and so forth. And actually it doesn't look too bad, um, but you can see that the scatter is worse for the cross flow case. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the modern day uh, way of predicting it. And the issue is here is not can you predict um, the location? It's can you uh, predict the critical end factor that you're going to use in your aircraft design? Um, and what I've highlighted here is the scatter, uh, the uncertainty. Now, bear in mind that these are logarithmic values. So um, a variation of n from five to eight on the x-axis, which is the cross flow axis, is an order of magnitude. Okay. it's um, uh, well, it's possibly it's 30 to 40 times amplitude. So that's quite difficult to believe that in a single flight test, you're changing your amplitude uh, of your initial disturbances by a factor of 40. You're not changing the geometry. You're not flying through clouds. And what that tells you is we haven't got a handle on the physics. However, um, I mean, the interesting thing is I've seen the latest versions of these plots. I mean, this dates from nearly 30 years ago, I've seen the latest versions and, and they're not a lot better. Um, so that whole sort of 
do we understand the aerodynamics uh, within a factor of 40 in terms of the physics that drives our onset of turbulent flow? The answer is we don't. And of course, as all aerodynamicists in the room will know, uh, we're constantly told that the aerodynamics is fixed. What we now need to move on is more difficult problems of uh, you know systems integration and, and uh, how we're going to get artificial intelligence onto the aircraft. So um, what do we do next is um, I was then looking at these methods thinking, well, this is all very nice predictive tool. What's the impact going to be? Can we use it for design? And the answer was no, we didn't use it for design because what uh, people in the design office did was um, this green line here on the left right hand plot. They just do a sort of straight trapezium shape and said, we're going to design the plumbing to um, draw air through the surface of the wing. And that was going to be used to control uh, laminar turbulent transition. And you would have a structure like the one that's just appeared, uh, a substructure under the skin of the wing with lots and lots of different plenum chambers. It's, it's, it's been known for, I don't know, 60 years or so that if you suck small quantities of air through the surface of the wing, um, then you will uh, delay the growth of these instabilities that lead to turbulence. So um, the next thing task I set myself was really to, to say we can do better than this trapezium shape, because if you try and reproduce that trapezium shape with something like this, then you get something just as jagged um, in your uh, suction velocity distribution simply because um, every chamber is subjected to a slightly different external pressure. Uh, so, so this is crazy. This is certainly not the same as that. And I thought, well, you know, uh, can we do better than that? So I thought, well, let's turn it around. Rather than choosing a chamber to match a straight line suction distribution, let's actually see um, if we can um, have an iterative process where you just stick some chambers in, you do all the modeling, you look at your um, n factors, and, and then you make some design decisions about moving the chambers around. And there's a little speeded up video on the bottom left here, which shows that um, by the time we'd finished on a simple PC computer, I could be doing these iterations pretty much real time, uh, 15 minutes or something like that. Whereas when I started work at Hatfield in 92, one of these calculations of which there were 20,000 in this analysis, one calculation would take us eight hours. So this is the kind of things I was interested in doing, getting the tools to be a bit more productive. So what is it we're trying to do here? Well, here's one of these n factor plots. And um, the line at the top is the famous n equals nine. That's where uh, transition is going to occur. Um, but below that, I have a sort of safety margin because uh, wing skins with laser drilled holes are quite rough, quite hostile to cross flow instabilities themselves. So rather than blithely saying, let's just um, keep the amplification, the gain below nine, uh, I thought, well, let's put a let's put a safety margin in a significant safety margin. Let's keep them below four. So this is the distribution um, of the gain for this chamber layout. And uh, what you then do is you say, oh, OK, well, I've got far too much uh, leeway between my n factor curve and my threshold. So I don't need to have suction there. So I will remove some of my chambers. So uh, you see, I've taken a load of them out now. And that's pretty good. That gets me up exactly to my threshold. Well, I've still got um, some room to improve. Uh, and so, and indeed, from a systems perspective and a construction perspective, I'm trying to simplify it by um, uh, reducing the number of the amount of plumbing that's going in under the wing. And then you get a final result, which is this one here. Not only do you get the chamber positions, but you know exactly how much mass flow is going through those chambers. You know what the plenum pressure you need to drive that mass flow is. Therefore, you can cal calculate your pump losses, therefore your energy consumption. You can size your pumps. You can size your ducts. You can 
calculate the parasitic power and the parasitic weight that your system needs. And hey, presto, you've got a very good estimate of what the real benefit of this suction system is going to is going to deliver to you. Um, so those are the results I think I've published in 98, um, which at the time, uh, you know, we were reducing lift, improving lift to drag ratio by a couple of percent. And at the time, the people who were researching this area said, you know, we're going to get 40% drag reduction out of this technology. And this is one of the highlights of my research career. I have been one of those speakers who's presented results only to have someone stand up at the back of the room and shout at me saying, you have no business presenting results like that. Um, it was a German colleague and obviously his research laboratory was receiving an awful lot of money to do research in this technology and he didn't want anybody knowing that the prognosis was not as good as his team had suggested. Um, needless to say, uh, these numbers are accepted now uh, as being typical of the benefit you're going to get. But, you know, the nice thing was, was using a plain old simple bit of theory. And to be honest, all I added to that was a bit of ambition. Let's try and use these methods to specify what the system might look like. Um, got me some quite nice predictions um, really quite a long time ago. Um, so we're at 25 past seven already. Um, I'm going to leap ahead. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about City. It's an institution I'm very fond of, uh, the Northampton Institute, as it was. And, um, you know, I never tire of pointing out to uh, my colleagues at Imperial College that um, City was teaching aeronautics uh, a season before uh, Imperial because they're uh, their, their proposals for teaching degree in aeronautics didn't cut it in 1909. Um, but there you go. And then another thing I've got here is the timetable. Uh, this was in 1917, so we've moved on a little bit. But interestingly, there's just gymnastics pretty much every day. Um, the only gymnastics my students get up to nowadays is trying to avoid turning up to stuff. Um, so there you go, and um, there's another one of interest is um, the first aerodynamics examination paper on record. Um, I think they at least printed it after the exam, not before. Um, but there you go. I'm very fond of uh, City's history and my time there, to be honest. So um, <laughs> what I got to City, and obviously I had lots of software that was owned by various people, Kinetic, Airbus. BA Systems were actually quite good. They said, no, you can take it away and use it. But I then moved to academia and intellectual property being what it was, it was incredibly difficult to do anything more with these methods. So I thought, well, um, shortly after I got to City, I got a call from Mike Gaster, who will be known to some of you, did a lot of work on the Handley Page wing at Cranfield. Uh, Mike, who turned 90 in April this year, is still going strong. Mike said to me, Queen Mary aren't interested in my wind tunnel. Um, are you? And Stephen Ralston at Airbus was very supportive of keeping the wind tunnel going. And um, the guys, uh, Ray Kinkham and co at what was DTI, Department of Trade and Industry, is now Bayes, they also had some money capital expenditure. So guess what? Um, um, Her Majesty or John Q. Taxpayer paid for this fabulous wind tunnel to move um, to the institution that I just joined. So very, very lucky to have this um, wind tunnel. Uh, there's some nice pictures of things that you have inside wind tunnels, like turning vanes and fans. Um, this is the key one, which is that the uh, free stream turbulence when the tunnel is empty, the free stream turbulence in this one wind tunnel is 0.007%, okay, which is an incredibly low turbulence intensity. And every time that number is presented by myself or any colleagues or PhD students, uh, someone always says you have accidentally put an extra zero on the right-hand side of your decimal point. It is extraordinary tunnel environment. 
And so what better a place to try and start exploring um, some of the questions that I had, some of the assumptions I'd built into my model about how hard we needed to suck to control cross flow, all this kind of stuff. Um, it, I wish I could give you a happy ending. It's, it's a kind of work in progress. And given the time, I want to jump past all of this. What I will show you is a nice demonstration of what suction does to those 2D Tommy Schlichting waves. So um, those kind of uh, oscillations, those waves in, uh, in the Navier-Stokes simulation and also in the smoke visualization, the Van Dyke picture, when you take your section cut vertically um, parallel to the flow, then you see a very interesting double lobed structure here. And these are Tommy Schlichting waves. Um, and then if you apply a bit of gentle suction, you can see the suction is starts at the dotted line on the right hand plot. You can see that the waves, um, once they pass the start of the suction, they are then diminished. So it does work. And it was kind of one of the base baseline experiments we carried out to make sure that we um, we weren't talking complete nonsense. So my particular interest was in something called oversuction, which is when um, you suck too hard, um, you destroy the controlling function of the suction, and all you're doing is uh, disturbing the flow so much that you um, induce turbulence. So if you like, my design philosophy from the chamber exercise was you could suck very hard over a small region of the wing rather than having to suck not very hard over a large expanse of the wing and cluttering up fuel tanks, structure, anti-icing systems, and so on and so forth. The big question, and I think still unanswered, is, well, OK, Chris, nice idea. Suck very hard over a small region, but how hard can you suck? And so uh, this experiment uh, was starting down that route. And Ian Pohl's done some work on this in the past. Um, I wasn't entirely happy with his conclusions. Um, he's not here tonight, thank God. Otherwise, he'd really take me to task. But what we're seeing here um, is really the beneficial effect. So this is a spectral plot. Red is lots of disturbances across the frequency spectrum. And you can see on the left, we've got no suction. We've covered up our suction holes. And then as we go to the right and increase the suction rates, we get progressively reduction in the amount of red. But if we keep sucking, we start to see a, um, a little blob of red appearing in the bottom right-hand corner. And that's, that's over suction. That's not good news. So rather than stabilizing the disturbances, we are exciting them. I'm going to jump through the cross flow stuff, which is fascinating, but I don't have time. What I want to talk to you, um, the final thing, and I thought stick in a video of an A380 high lift system deploying because it's cool, um, is the other aspect of um, turbulent flow, which is the mixing. Um, and if I go through and increase the, the slides on here, when I talked about um, mixing between uh, laminar and turbulent streams. I talked about uh, slowing down faster moving flow, but mixing also does the opposite. It speeds up slower moving flow. And when you're designing uh, a high lift system, this is a, a simulation by uh, a great friend and colleague from Farnborough days, Dr. Malcolm Arthur. When you're designing a high lift system, what you want to try and avoid is here, here the red is slow moving flow. What you want to try and avoid is, is slow moving flow over regions where you're generating lots of lift and you're, we call it working the boundary layer hard. Um, and you need to be very careful you don't work it too hard, otherwise um, the wing stalls. And so uh, flow that is naturally turbulent and mixing, exchanging momentum between fluid streams is actually quite a good thing to have on a high lift system. So. Um, one of the things we we're kind of quite interested in was the inability of computational fluid dynamics at that stage to actually predict what is the maximum lift coefficient of a wing. And hypothesis, um, which was nothing more than seat of the pants, was 
part of the reason that there's so much variability in these predictions is that none of these methods um, predict the change from laminar to turbulent flow. Either they start laminar and then at some magic point it becomes turbulent, or more commonly, they just a few assume that the flow is turbulent all the way from the beginning of the leaning edge. Um, neither of which are true. Okay, um, and the the importance of this, as it says in the middle of the slide, slide there, is that your stalling speed and therefore your approach speed uh, and your runway length and all these things are dependent upon your maximum lift coefficient. Okay, um, I worked on a project that funded the experimental work I'm about to talk you through. And Airbus were kind to show us, but we obviously weren't allowed to take the, um, take the data away, the variability of the observed in flight tests, maximum lift coefficient, simply as you stretch the aircraft. So this is an aircraft with the same wing, the 319, the 320, the 321, and all the 340 stretches. Um, and you'd think, okay, well, it's the same wing, so it's going to be pretty much the same maximum lift coefficient. None of it. Massive variability, and who knows? Was it to do with fuselage interference effects? Was it to do with changes to jigs they'd made as the um, aircraft had progressed in maturity? Who knows? Um, but they had massive variability uh, uh, across this CL max parameter, and it remains, I think, today to be you know, it, it's it's a big risk. You design your aircraft and it achieves a better CL max and effectively you're carrying around unnecessary weight. Uh, if you design your aircraft, it doesn't achieve its CL max. You spend millions making sure it does achieve its target CL max. Um, so, um, Malcolm did this simulation, uh, very interesting, and he did... He tweaked the position of transition onset in his simulations, and he got very different results for CL Max. So, okay, there's some mileage in here. Um, and so it was many years later that at City, I thought, okay, well, I've got a very low turbulence wind tunnel. Let's try and have a look at the effect of two effectively aerofoil sections in close proximity um, on, on the flow characteristics, on the transition characteristics, because... That's the problem with trying to predict what's going on in the main element of a, a high lift system, is you've got a slat, which is a horribly shaped thing just upstream, and then the flap, which is doing a huge amount of the legwork in generating lift, is also under the influence of the, of the wake from both the slat and the main element, and that's, that's for a three-element configuration. So I had a um, very hard-working PhD student who was a great trawler through the literature, who came up to me um, after a few weeks and he said, Chris, we've got a problem. And I said, well, what's that demo? He said, well, no one's ever done the configuration that you're proposing before. So mine was simply to have, have a wake close to a boundary layer and see what happened. He said, no, we've had, we've had people who've put um, bottom left grids in front of our experiment to generate uh, grid turbulence, but that's not what we've got in the high lift consideration. And we've got people who put isolated elements, which is a bit more like it, but they were circular bars. So they had very um, structured um, von Karman vortex streets coming off them. So that, again, wasn't much use. Um, so this is basically what we set up in, in Gaster's tunnel, which is an aerofoil um, with a wake, a velocity deficit behind it, um, ahead of... Um, you know, classic university aerodynamics experiment, nice flat surface, no nasty curvature or lifting or anything like that to complicate things. <clears throat> and we simply did a parameter study of moving, uh, moving the, the upstream wing uh, forward and back and up and down. In fact, the forward and back wasn't a hugely influential parameter, but the up and down really was. And um, by this stage, we had uh, computer control over the hot wire anemometry system in the wind tunnel, set the experiment going Friday lunchtime, come back Monday morning and you had a terabyte of data and you hadn't broken the hot wire and you hadn't um, overheated the wind tunnel motor. It was so quiet running at about 18 meters per second, I think this is, um, that even the security people walking through the labs over the weekend didn't know the wind tunnel was running. 
Um, so really high productivity. Um, when one of these papers was published, we had a problem with a reviewer who got so excited, he said, this is some of the best quality data I've ever seen. The paper must be resubmitted with all the data you captured. Um, so fortunately, we, weren't, uh, we didn't have to do that. Anyway, um, this is, is very specific stuff um, about uh, turbulent boundary layers under forcing of turbulence. And what, again, rather, rather the same way as I was interested in the, the combination of two different transition mechanisms on a sweat wing, it's the same sort of thing here is there's an established mechanism that I've shown you of infinitesimal disturbances growing um, versus a high turbulence environment, which is the bottom right, which is where you've got a lot of stuff going on in the oncoming airflow, already developed turbulent flow, and it's contaminating uh, the laminar flow on the plate. And you see different flow patterns um, as, we sh as we see here. Um, and you also get a uh, slight different physics. <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things that came out of this work, um, we, well, Damo picked up real different characteristics depending on how close uh, the wing was to the plate. But we still ended up with these really weird straight lines. Um, in terms of how quickly the flow became turbulent as a function of how far away the wing was in terms of vertical separation. Now, I might seem intuitive, but given how complex the physics is, I really wasn't expecting to see a linear trend um, just between the separation and the onset of location. And in that trend line, you will see, well, you won't see, but there is a switch from one physical mechanism to another, but it's still uh, a straight line. And I, you know, there's no question in the quality of the measurements, but I think there's something else to the story that we haven't worked out yet to explain um, that really, really good trend. Um, here's another thing that, that is always a nice thing to pick up when you're doing this kind of work. People work in uh, laminar turbulent transition in the turbulent machinery field as well. So you can imagine in your um, trend engine, uh, the kind of quality of flow that's coming down onto your, um, your turbine blades. And this is the stuff that all goes on at Whittle Lab, um, John Denton and co. And they're very dismissive of the kind of theories that I was talking about earlier on. Um, but you know, th there is a perception that perhaps both mechanisms coexist. And again, this has been dismissed by the turbine machinery community. And yet, um, Damo was able to capture exactly that with his growth rate. So what you see um, on the left is typical characteristics of the amplitude of disturbances in a high turbulent environment. So as you move downstream, so this is Reynolds number based on X, so it's a kind of way of non-dimensionalizing the streamwise distance, you get this um, quite straight line behavior um, in terms of your disturbance energy. And that's a very typical characteristic of um, a high turbulent environment. Then as you move the um, uh, wake, the wing away, on the right-hand plot, there's our straight line in blue, which is the same as the one on the left-hand plot. But our disturbance growth actually is an exponential curve, which is the basis of that logarithmic gain that I was telling you about. And um, what you actually see um, in between the two at 30 millimeters separation is a combination of both sets of physics, okay? Which again, is a wonderful evidence that you, know, you need to take both mechanisms into account for this kind of flow. So again, trying to, trying to take this back to a high lift situation, uh, predicting CL max, you, know, you would need completely different models to capture these two um, physical mechanisms within your computational method. And, you know, we were starting from a position where there no, were no models at all. So we're kind of understanding the complexity of trying to predict. Um, I mean, we're nowhere near predicting CL max, but we are observing what happens in the flow field between two aerodynamic surfaces very close together that influences the development of turbulence. Well, I've 
Wow, it's five to eight. Well, I'm just going to finish on um, what on earth has this got to do with aircraft? Well, this is a nice chart that's used by a lot of um, aircraft design textbook. This is called a sizing diagram. And um, you plot a lot of performance curves on it. Uh, and you rule out uh, points in the design space uh, where you can't put your aircraft. So the design space is typically uh, captured by your wing loading. Uh, so the weight of the aircraft, the maximum takeoff weight divided by the wing area. Uh, and the thrust loading for, for jet aircraft, which is, again, your, um, your static sea level thrust um, divided by your maximum takeoff weight. So those are the kind of, that's your two-dimensional design space. And anything in red won't do. Uh, so you want to be in the white region. So what are the curves that um, define the white region? Well, they are, in turn, uh, the green one, which is your straight and level thrust, your cruise, and that's driven largely by your, your drag coefficient and the friction drag I was talking about trying to manage. Um, and then you've got... Um, your grey, your flat one, which is the thrust required to climb out with one engine for a twin-engined aircraft. And that's interesting because that, that is dependent on the lift-to-drag ratio with takeoff flat. Um, and again, so you're, you're interested in the performance you can get out of your wing on that. And then finally, the vertical line is um, the size of wing you need to be able to land uh, safely and within uh, the confines of a typical uh, runway length. All three of those parameters which define the size and therefore the cost and therefore the marketability of your aircraft depend very heavily on how turbulent your flow is. So I'll finish. Be happy to take some questions. I will flash my thank you slides uh, of the last two. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope I haven't lost too many of you or bored too many of you. Happy to take questions. Any questions in the room? Any questions? Any questions? Okay, uh, I've, I've got a question. I've got a question. Um, so there's been like an influx of novel aircraft designs uh, in, in, in recent years. Um, do you see there there being any challenge for adapting these new designs to legacy turbulence models? Um, I'm sure there will be. Um, I think one of the things we decided was um, going to be a real challenge was uh, stealthy aircraft. So this is not new, um, but aircraft with sweep angles of around 45 degrees for um, uh, RF signature reasons. And that's obviously a highly classified area, but I would say that those aircraft are not exactly uh, tempted to do high G aggressive aerodynamic maneuvers because I think the, the operational envelope is limited. Um, from my perspective, and I'm not, I'm not an expert in that, in that flow regime, but again, it's a region of flow interactions and changing flow mechanisms that were avoided for decades because people knew it was difficult. And RF signature reasons took people down that way. Um, where you're going now um, is also interesting. So you've got all sorts of things like boundary layer ingestion and, and um, uh, unducted fans and acoustic signatures. I think, again, those, those, are those are very challenging things. I think boundary layer ingestion idea is quite a nice one from the aerodynamics perspective, and it's an absolute horror show if you're a a fan designer, and imagine having to design fan blades that are chopping through um, wake profiles of, of oncoming air. So, yes, I think is the short answer to that question. Thank you very much. Um, Peter? Hi. So, Chris, um, will there be an HLFC uh, airliner? You're, you're asking me to bet the pension. It's really difficult to say. Um, I think the great thing is people are being much more realistic about what you're going to get out of it. 
and what the what the engineering challenges are. Uh, I think people were very dismissive about um, uncertainties in the modeling, and I think they're they're doing a bit more work on that now. Um, I know Shahid, who I mentioned, is is involved with um, Airbus, Steve Ralston and Co. developing more sophisticated models. It's a really difficult one, Pete. I mean, I, what really what amuses me um, is that if you think um, laminar flow is difficult for all the reasons I've given, then hydrogen fueled aircraft must surely be practically impossible. And yet, the enthusiasm with which everyone has promised that their research budgets are going to hydrogen fueled aircraft has, well, let's say it's caused many a wry smile um, amongst people working on other technologies. So interesting at last month's ICAS conference, uh, the US contingent were, were a little bit dismissive of hydrogen um, and, um, and they're talking about sustainable aviation fuels, the drop-in solution whilst other technologies mature. So coming back to laminar flow, I haven't got a clue. It is, it is the political football of all political footballs when it comes to uh, aerospace technologies. Notice how I didn't answer your question. Hi, Chris. Just on the, um, your high turbulence and low turbulence um, mechanisms there, do you think the influence of compressibility in those, even at those relatively low speeds? Um, not, not in our, not in our tunnel, I don't think, but. Um, Certainly, on a, a high lift system, you're transonic around the the nose of the slat, aren't you? So there's all sorts of going, stuff going in there. The compressibility is another thorny issue because um, <clears throat> the models, the the n factor models that I was talking about, are traditionally applied in industry without any um, sense of compressibility coming being needed to be taken into account. And yet we know that if you run the model allowing for compressibility, you get significantly lower amplitudes, lower end factors. Um, and this just seems to be um, an anomaly that has, is not being explored. I mean, it's the classic, yeah, you know, we've sort of the aerodynamics. Uh, let's, let's focus on the more important stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, answer to Peter's question, the reason for me that, that laminar flow has not got anywhere yet is because the uncertainty and therefore the risk about what you're actually going to get um, is just too daunting. You know? So what should you be doing is answering those unknowns, but that doesn't seem to be what's, what's going on. So. Um. The, um, all the suction effects looks very, very interesting. I'm just wondering uh, whether you've investigated whether as the um, boundary layer thins as you um, suck more, could there be some sort of a, an onset cavity effect where the size of your suction holes becomes uh, important? Or could it be as, as um, silly that you, your, it starts to vibrate the surface? Yeah, so Barry, who did the work, did quite a lot of uh, looking at that, um, and you know, we, we were looking, to be honest, we're looking at the vibration and the, some kind of acoustic feedback and forcing mechanism without there being any um, suction running, which is why the solution was to tape over the holes. In fact, he got very, he got no difference when he taped over the holes as when he left the whole thing um, with with the cavities open. Um, the, the thinning effect and the relative length scale is quite interesting. Again, Barry was, lo was loath to use any non-dimensional terms. So, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to what liters per minute means in the context of a wind tunnel experiment. Um, but at least, you know, he kind of progressed in regular steps of liters per minute. Um, but typically the stabilization effect is achieved with really, really low mass flow rates. So you're not thinning the boundary layer considerably. Um, there's all the arguments about you changing the Reynolds number, you're changing the stability characteristics, but predominant effect is 
changing that near wall behavior because you're removing some of the low momentum air. So um, I, I didn't see it as a major thing. But um, I mean, to be fair, and you can tell that here was a numerical guy let loose in the wind tunnel. All the PhD projects that I supervised, I, I set far too challenging demands on the students of what I thought I'd, they'd get done in three, three and a half years. Um, and, um, and particularly since we had quite a lot of them, they couldn't get into the wind tunnel that often. Um, so kind of salutary lesson for me, but a good one to learn because, you know, um, you've now got someone who's, who's seen both sides of the story of just how challenging experimental work is um, and how it needs to be given time to get everything right because you know if you've got a big experimental campaign you subsequently find out that the data is rubbish you know it's a nightmare at least with the cfd code you can fix your bug um, you can fix the line to the statement where you wrote pi equals 22 over 7 and rerun the simulation and nobody will know. But you can't do that with a wind tunnel campaign. On the, um, on the measurements, the experimental side, if you had an unlimited budget, what would, your, would be your instrument of choice? Nothing in hot wires. Um, I mean, a hot wire is great um, because it's it's so non-intrusive until you want to get more than one velocity component. Um, I think you know we we we'd look at things like LDA. The big challenge was not having oil fouling up um, a tunnel whose honeycomb was was basically wax paper and anecdotal evidence from Kevin Gary, amongst others, that the, the inside of the Cranfield tunnels were like um, like a chip shop after they've been doing modern flow visualization. So, yeah, um, you know, the, the flow vis companies are now coming out with surfactant um, bubble generators, and we're hoping to get hold of one of those. Um, so I'm still working with Chetan down at City, and I think we'd both like to quite try uh, something like that out. But when you've got a fellow of the Royal Society saying, over my dead body, are we going to have particulates in my low turbulence wind tunnel? It's kind of quite difficult. Um, I think you do something like that. I mean, you know, it's what I've left out is the kind of very detailed CFD stuff. And those of you who are on Twitter, probably not many in the room, know that a couple of weeks ago I had a very entertaining spat um, with somebody who chastised me for believing in the circulation theory of lift. And one of the things he said was, you must never conflate mathematics and observation, which made me laugh because, of course, you know, modern aerodynamics is all about getting your observations and your, and your analysis matching up. Um, so, yes, picking up, picking up some of those things. I mean, the... I suppose the big challenge which you can get from a hot wire because it's got an excellent um, frequency response rate is those very high frequency bursts that lead to turbulence and kind of why it stayed very, very popular because you're picking up the onset of turbulent spots in a way that perhaps flow vis, you know, be very difficult to resolve that. Um, I have a quick one. Um, if there is a big sort of uh, pot of gold of performance you can unlock, if you do kind of really get a good model and a good prediction and you can embed this into a physical aircraft, do you see a lot more investment going in in other parts of the world in recent years with the rise of the likes of China? If they can sort of see there's a big potential here, we're going to put huge amounts of spending into this to try and develop a really cutting edge military aircraft or civil aircraft. I'm just interested from a more kind of international point of view, do you see it still being a kind of UK, US, EU, yeah, Europe led? Sort of research field. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I was I was taken over to China uh, a, less than a decade ago um, to by a guy called Peter Barrett, who helped me out when I was president of the society. So I helped him out by going to China. He thought they were the only country likely to develop another supersonic transport, and I delivered a series of lectures on. Um, uh, 
transition and predictive technologies and the results that we've got to the team at the China Aeronautical Research and Development Corporation. We've got, got these fabulous wind tunnel labs um, and they were all asleep after an hour. So um, I don't know <laughs> if, that, if that's the, the prospects. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, for, for all their flaws, um, Boeing have had absolutely the right approach to this, which is very much toe in the water. The first thing to do was say, OK, um, we can get a natural laminar flow surface. How does it shape up in service? What do the operators think of it? Does it deliver a tangible fuel benefit? Um, and they've done this with the, the 757 and the 787 nacelles, and they're gradually increasing the amount of laminar flow they offer on the aircraft. So. You know, you talk about disruptive technologies, but it's it's not a disruptive environment. You know, you're not going to risk what is quite a fragile, high stakes, low return business on disruptive technologies. Um, but again, I mean, I I said this. I, I was invited to a sort of Airbus summit ooh, 15 years ago on where goes laminar flow technology, and I said, you know, guys, I think this is what you need to do. I think this is what Boeing are doing, and it makes perfect sense to me. And I was accused of being um, unadventurous. So, so there you go. So, turbulence research it seems to be critical to be able to uh, make logical inferences from a kind of complicated, multivariable, multi-physics environment. Do you see there any potential for the application of AI in terms of uh, you know, helping guide and you know scope investigations? Uh, and in, because in itself, like AI has sort of demonstrated the, the ability to um, take, make inferences from multivariable inputs. So it seems like a potentially an ideal match, much in a way that sort of like uh, you know, computer controlled uh, data collection and things like that have kind of revolutionized sort of like physical testing in the past. Uh, well, yes, I mean, you know, the, the, the complexities of AI, I'm not qualified to talk about. What I can absolutely say, one of the things I've always wanted to do is to couple that incredible um, data capture capability of running the wind tunnel for a weekend without and just leaving it and getting all these terabytes of data to an AI algorithm where you're basically, um, you know, because 90% of our data points are steady laminar flow or well-behaved disturbances that we understand is, is using an algorithm to pick up on where there are interesting things going on in the flow which might be intermittent, um, and then focusing the, the Travis rig and the sensors on that particular area of the flow and gathering data where there's something interesting going on. So, um, you know, that's an obvious example that I would, I would do tomorrow if I could interest people um, in funding that kind of work. Thank you very much. I'll uh, pass over to Peter for the bed, thanks. Yeah. Right. So, um, calls on me to give um, to space and thanks. Um, I'll go on to this, this, uh, this microphone. So, um, Chris, uh, condensing your whole career into an hour it, it, it is quite, yeah, quite something. <laughs> Not to put, push it all together. A fantastic uh, hour was worth a revision for me. Uh, and saying, so, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Uh, and, and because of that, I didn't actually write quite so many notes because I was concentrating so hard. So I, I guess that's, that's, that's a good thing. That <laughs> it was interesting enough that I was concentrating hard. There's certain things. I mean, I will take away. I, I really liked your description of the of the the, the DNS flow and the, the the waves, the noodles, and the kelp. So I'll I'll, I'll bear that in mind. Uh, we don't want, noodles are not too bad, but kelp is bad. Uh, <laughs> that's a great thing. Um, and uh, yeah, way too much. Um, me, me trying to process even as I go along. Um, but uh, as somebody who's actually trying to design a high level system at the moment for a real aeroplane um, and, and getting a, a lot of flack for not being able to predict CL max uh, accurately or um, put, putting really big aero bands on whatever I tell anybody. So, well, it might be this, but you know, you never know. Be um, it's, it's good to have uh, have somebody of um, your standing um, confirm that uh, 
but it is still really, really difficult, whatever, because the senior management just say, oh, you've got, you've got a CFD now, you know, just do the CFD, that'd be good. Don't quite work that way. Anyway, uh, it has been a fantastic lecture. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I hope we've got lots and lots of people online uh, and, and they've all enjoyed it as well. I think everybody in the audience here has enjoyed it. Um, so I think we all want to thank you in the traditional way. Thank you very much.